was interesting when I was asked to do this. I've been a food policy economist now for more years than I care to remember. And most of that time, I've worked in the agricultural and rural sector trying to get food security across the board. And so resilience for me has always been about planting trees, trying to reduce runoff, dikes, buns, all the, the, the things, many of the things that John also sort of talked about. And I, so I Googled it and found that when you actually Google resilience, that's not what you get. In fact, most of it is focused on people, and a huge amount of it is actually focused on children. It's a part of child development for children to be resilient to change and new things in their lives and being able to handle it. And I thought, well, that's very interesting because I'd already decided when I was asked to speak on this that I wasn't going to bring you WFP's climate change approach and adaptation and resilience, that I was going to bring you what I think is the most important thing in resilience, and it picks up on David's people-centered approach. And for me, that is the nutritional resilience of people, and particularly children. You know, at the end of the day, Food security is often looked at at national and global levels, but it's an individual definition. It's only fulfilled at the individual level. And the same for me with resilience. It's fulfilled at the individual level. We need to work across the sectors. We need to work globally. We need to work together. But ultimately, it's fulfilled at an individual level when that person is resilient to what goes on. And a fundamental part of that is their nutritional status. Many of my sort of comments are going to be framed around uh, Bangladesh. I spent two years working there looking after the bank's nutrition portfolio. And when I arrived, I arrived at the beginning of 2008. And um, six months before, they'd had a major cyclone, Cyclone Cedar, which had hit probably a third to 50% of the country, uh, wiped out a major rice harvest. And if you think of the timing, at the beginning of 2008, the food price crisis was really beginning to bite. And for Bangladesh, normally, it wouldn't buy rice particularly. It's almost self-sufficient. It buys a little. But of course, this year, it lost a major harvest. So it actually needed to buy rice, which it normally does from India. And of course, we all know India decided to guard its own food systems. So it put not an export ban on, but it actually put a minimum price of $1,000 a metric ton of rice, which means that if you've got gold rice, that's fine. But if you want basic rice, this is not terribly helpful. So Bangladesh was really stuck. So the food price crisis also hit it. Now, to put this in a context, when I arrived, I started looking at the nutrition statistics. And if you put this in context, in the year 2000, Bangladesh had a wasting rate of 10%. Now, why do I focus on wasting? Well, for those who don't know the nutritional statistics so well, wasting is weight for height. So it takes account of the fact that a kid may have been malnourished for years and is therefore too short. It's their weight for their height. It's the emergency indicator. It's the one that when you get to three standard deviations from the mean, children start dying. It's the one we use in an emergency, in a refugee camp, whatever. When that goes up, this is when we really start sounding the alarms. In Bangladesh, it was 10%. In 2004, it was 13%. In 2007, before the cyclone, it was 16%. Now, the emergency threshold for that indicator is 15%. At 15%, you start sounding alarm bells. So it was 16%. In that same period of time from 2000 to 2007, there'd been no major disasters in Bangladesh, which is actually quite unusual. And poverty had fell nine percentage points. So while all this is going on very positively, the wasting rate is going up. And when I arrived, it was not even on the radar screen. It, it wasn't in my current agency. It wasn't in the agency I worked for then. It wasn't in any of the agencies who were part of the health sector swap. So the first thing was to start raising that agenda. Now, why was that important? Well, because we didn't even know where those 16% of kids were. 
I mean, it's almost one in five kids. We didn't know where they were. So if you have a cyclone that hits 30, 50% of the country, you cannot respond to all of it immediately. You do not get to every error instantaneously. So if you don't know where that 16% of kids is, then you've got a major problem because you may not get to them in time. In the food price crisis that followed, DFID actually did a really good study that showed the wasting rate actually went to 25% in some communities. 25% of the kids were wasted. And again, we didn't know where they were. So in terms of resilience, this population was not resilient to this crisis in any shape or form. And we don't have the statistics, but I have no doubt whatsoever that some kids died as a result of both the food price crisis and the cyclone, and that the fundamental cause of that was malnutrition. That's rarely what's on the death certificate. The death certificate is what disease they got as a result of being so compromised nutritionally. So how did Bangladesh respond? Well, if you actually looked at the production statistics for Bangladesh, for rice, for 2007, 2008, 2009, you actually wouldn't even see a blip on the horizon. Because Bangladesh, like many countries, responded by massive subsidies into rice production, re-establishing the paddies, irrigation subsidies, seed subsidies. So the next harvest was a bumper harvest. So it wiped out any blip in the system. I went to many food security seminars, both as a result of the cyclone, but certainly as a result of the price volatility. And to be frank, I have never been to so many bad food security seminars in my life. Um, you know, I remember going to one led by some real figureheads in Bangladesh, and this person talking about rice and the fact that we were almost self-sufficient. But now we really needed to invest more, and we really need to make sure we produce more rice and we were going to do more rice. And he had this table of what we were producing, what research they needed to do, how much more they needed to produce. And he chained down this table and he got to the end and he said, and then we'll be nutritionally secure. And I, I, I'm, I'm sitting there like, uh, hang on, we just went from rice self-sufficiency to nutritional security. And I had to remind him that in India many years ago, they were a rice deficit country. They are now a rice surplus country, and they export rice. But in actual fact, more than 40% of their kids are underweight or stunted. You know, poverty's fallen through the floor, but agriculture's not delivered nutritionally. And why do I say there's a problem? Well, now Bangladesh, as a result, wants higher rice reserves in the country. So it wants to breed more rice, it wants to do more rice. Did I ever hear any discussion of biofortification? In Bangladesh, there are actually some high iron, high zinc rices starting to be available. Are they using those as the breeding lines to increase rice production? Generally speaking, no. So in many parts of the world now, we have staple foods which have higher micronutrient profiles. They have been screened, but we do not start with them as the basic breeding lines of going forward to improve the resilience of the farming system. In Bangladesh, the dairy industry is frankly pathetic. You buy your milk imported from New Zealand and Australia. There's no need for that. But when you have a focus on your staple grains on rice, and only on rice, and when the response to any disaster is that the government will come in and rebuild the rice sector, but it will not rebuild the fruit sector, the vegetable sector, the poultry sector, the rest of the livestock sector, then farmers do what farmers do. They go for rice, because there's no insurance markets for them. There's no credit markets. So essentially, the fact that the government has this as a policy means that farmers will act accordingly. So they will continue to grow rice, even though it's not necessarily even a poverty-reducing crop for them. So, you know, we have to look more broadly at the policy systems and what gets promoted. 
Because for me, ultimately, if we're talking about resilience and human resilience, then the issue is nutrition. And particularly as a starter, it's nutrition in the first thousand days. Because in the first thousand days, that's when your body is forming everything. It's forming the brain, it's connecting all the pathways in the brain. It's establishing the potential of a human being. If you don't get the child in that thousand days, which is from conception to two years of age, that child will never have the same potential, which means they will potentially never have the resilience to shocks that they could have done. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Finn.